All right, welcome, 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 everybody. Happy Friday. I am Joe Bita, and welcome to TGI Kubernetes. Uh, for those not in the know, uh, this is a weekly-ish uh, live stream that we do here at VMware. Uh, we uh, talk about all things Kubernetes, do some live coding, learn some stuff together, pick a topic. Um, and uh, we've been doing it for quite a while now. We're almost on episode 90, where this is 89. We have to do something big when we actually get to to 100. Um, so yeah, so um, just for those who haven't joined us before, the way that uh, generally this works is say hi to everybody in the comments here. I really want to be as interactive as possible with the comments. Uh, make sure that um, we uh, uh, cover sort of what's new in the Kubernetes world, and then uh, dig into a specific topic. Uh, this week it's going to be Tecton pipelines. Um, something that I haven't, uh, don't have any real experience with, but we'll learn together. Um, and oh, did I forget to say, I'm Joe Bita. I'm a, a principal engineer here at VMworld, uh, VMware, uh, and uh, came from Heptio and uh, actually helped start the Kubernetes project when I was, uh, was at Google. So uh, let me first say, oh man, thank you everybody for saying hi and joining in. Um, like Suresh was here early, he's joining us from Hamburg. Jason is in the Google office in New York. Thanks for staying late, Jason. And Jason is actually a Tecton contributor. So when we go off the rails, when we do something stupid, Jason's gonna actually help get us back on track. So thanks for joining us. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, let's see, we have uh, uh, Malik from India joining from the VMware office in Bangalore. You really are staying up late. I'm actually gonna be in India next week. It's the first time I'll be out there in like five years. I'm gonna be hitting uh, visiting some customers in Mumbai and, and Delhi and then and then uh, visiting the the Bangalore office a uh, really quick trip we'll see if I uh, if I stay awake <laughs> um, let's see Ola from uh, Copenhagen uh, good to see you um, uh, Yatin from Virginia Rory from Scotland that's a very Scottish name Rory uh, welcome welcome Elid from from Bris Bristol uh, England Shahar from Atlanta, Lamati, good to see you, Sandeep, Christy, Amine from Strasbourg. Oh, wow, it just jumped on me here. Uh, Nuno from Portugal, Thorsten from Germany, Nuremberg, Harry from Rottendam, Sean from Birmingham, Heacham from Paris, Arango, 90, we're almost to 90, yeah. Alexis from Orle or Orleans, which I assume is France. Uh, Carlton from Austin, Duffy from San Francisco. How's it going, Duffy? Oh, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Go Gutierrez is from Colombia. Uh, Joe from Atlanta. Vidyam, wow. Wales, good to see you. Steve is out in the, on the East Coast. Where you're at, in Pittsburgh, right, Steve? Um, Sloka, James from Minneapolis. Lewis from Cardiff. Uh, Ishwar from India. Uh, oh, and then Christy Wilson is also a Tecton contributor. So welcome, welcome, Christy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Squall Bogdan from Romania. Uh, Bjorn, Christian from Germany. Karam, Manoj. <laughs> you know, this is the thing that always catches me by surprise is that folks are really coming in from everywhere. We have uh, Ola Khan from Nigeria. It's just super crazy. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Okay, so the first order of business is I moved in here to our offices in uh, VMware in Bellevue, and we are not allowed to keep beer in the fridge. Uh, so I got my own fridge. And then I went to Costco, and I got a flat of, like, Monster, because, you know, it's afternoon, it's a Friday. And so I'm, I'm going to decide what flavor. I think I'm going to go with purple here. Because Monster doesn't come in flavors, it just comes in colors. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do purple. <laughs> yeah, Bogdan's saying that saying hi to everybody doesn't really scale. So cheers, everyone. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, if you go to, and I'm going to switch to my screen here. If you go to uh, tgik.io notes, it'll take you to this HackMD here. And I'll go ahead and I'll put this in uh, in here. And this is our notes for the episode. 
um, we can crowdsource these things. And so if you log in, you know, please be nice, don't graffiti, um, but you can add to the notes if there's a link or if you wanna add some time codes, um, you know, we can do this. I try and clean these things up, check them into our GitHub repo after the fact. And so everybody should feel free to get involved there. I have a lot of stuff that I wanna talk about uh, before we get started. So I'm gonna try and move through this stuff really fast. Um, and I, I'm not gonna click on every link. So, okay, so uh, last week we didn't have an episode because I and uh, pretty much everybody was down in um, uh, uh, was down in, in San Francisco for VMworld. And we made a lot of Kubernetes announcements down there. And the first thing that we talked about was uh, VMware Tanzu, and I'm wearing the t-shirt. It's kind of an Iron Man t-shirt. We got that on the back. We got the logo, that on the front, the logo on the back. Um, so Tanzu is our overarching sort of portfolio of products related to Kubernetes and modern applications. Um, it's just a way for us to give a name so that when we talk to customers, when we talk to folks, we can talk about the entire experience that we're providing, not just specific products. Um, and uh, so that's something that we're super excited about. I'm not going to click through all the links here, but we have uh, 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 something that introduces Tanzu in general. Um, but then we really break this down around what we're talking about as, as build, run, manage. And build is how do you build and run applications? How do you manage and deploy those applications? Uh, manage is how do you manage this from IT point of view across multiple clusters specifically? How do you actually start meeting that sort of IT policy meets application team and really create the right interface there so that those teams can, uh, can, can uh, uh, coordinate and cooperate? And then finally, and I'll explain what Tanzu means in a second here. Uh, and, and then finally, we have run. And so this is how do we provide a way to run Kubernetes in a whole bunch of different places, whether that be on the cloud, whether that be on, uh, on something like vSphere on-prem or, or even down to bare metal. Um, and, so, uh, and so we had big announcements in each of these things. Uh, in the build category, we announced that, you know, uh, and this was actually happened during the earnings call the week before, but uh, VMware announced the intent to acquire Pivotal, which is very exciting. It's going to be uh, a, a lot of work on everybody, you know, to figure out how to bring these teams together, but it just makes so much sense. Super excited to, to, to welcome the Pivotal folks on board. On that managed side, we introduced this thing called Tanzu Mission Control, which is a commercial service for being able to... Um, uh, being able to manage and set policy across a lot of clusters. And then, uh, and then finally, there's Project Pacific, which we announced, which is really building Kubernetes into vSphere uh, in, a, in a pretty fundamental way, which is really exciting in terms of being able to bring uh, new capabilities to vSphere built on top of Kubernetes. So it's really not about just running Kubernetes on vSphere. It's really about how can we use Kubernetes to make vSphere better for all vSphere users, which is really exciting. Um, Tanzu itself is a name. There's uh, Tanzu with a Z is actually Swahili, I understand. Uh, uh, and it means sort of like branch. And so uh, I think, you know, the connotation of like, hey, branching out in a new direction is really, really fun. And then Tanzu with an S is a Japanese word for a traditional Japanese cabinet that was actually built to go on the back of horse carts or on ships or whatever. So it's flexible and durable. And so it's like a portable container, which is actually kind of cool. So that's where the Tanzu name actually uh, comes from there. Um, and then, and I see that folks are already asking questions about actually deploying and installing uh, Tecton, which is awesome. Definitely go for it. Um, and then there's one thing that I did want to call out here is we introduced this thing called Kubernetes Academy. And we're really excited about this. And we even got a cool domain, kubernetes.academy. Um, and this is a, a bunch of uh, learning resources to start getting into Kubernetes. And, you know, uh, and so we have here like things like a containers 101, really just getting folks in. And uh, some of our uh, some of the, the VMware folks have contributed here, whether these be uh, sort of our trainers or uh, some of our, our architects like Duffy and Scott that go out into the field and work with customers or just, you know, other engineers um, or, or folks in uh, in VM, uh, VMware. So super, super fun uh, and interesting there. And so um, really excited about this. The reception here has been great. Um, and uh, a lot of folks have reached out saying, hey, you know, can we actually help build this up and actually uh, get involved with this? And so we're definitely looking to make this to be a, a more uh, community curated resource. Really excited about it. Um, 
and um, and we want this to be vendor neutral. So like, you know, I'll talk about Tanzu, I'll talk about Pacific, but I think, you know, from our point of view, the more people who can understand and be effective in Kubernetes, like the better it is for everyone. And so we're really viewing this as a, uh, as something that stretches across all that. And I think also like we're, you know, we uh, we have some of the TGIK stuff going on here also. So, so you know, you can find the link to that. Um, so we're trying to sort of make that part of the, the larger footprint. Um, so that's super exciting. Okay, other stuff we got to go on. Um, so 1.16 is coming up and there's going to be some APIs removed, some deprecated APIs. Uh, we've talked about this before. Valerie wrote a great blog article about it. Um, if you're not ready for this and if you're just like on cruise control, this may catch you by surprise. And so it's something that you should be aware of. Uh, the KubeCon Cloud NativeCon schedule is up. Really exciting. Um, if you follow sort of Kubernetes Twitter, you'll see that there's a lot of people going yay and a lot of people very disappointed that their talk didn't get it uh, uh, accepted. It's, um, it's always hard to do these things. Uh, Brian Lyles, uh, uh, one of our colleagues here at VMware, was on the, the program committee and I think it was something like like, you know, only 10% of the submissions were, were accepted. Um, so, uh, but it's looking like an incredibly strong set of talks. It's going to be a really exciting conference. Uh, tickets are still available. And I think if you get in early, there's still a, a way to save money. Um, there's still an early, early ticket price. And this is going to be down in San Diego. Um, if you did not have a talk accepted or if you can travel to San Diego early, there is the Rejects Conference, and this has been put on by the uh, the Kinfolk folks, um, but I don't. I think they're they're the main sort of uh, uh, sponsors and, and coordinator there. Um, but this is really a fun event. So this is really just folks that are like, hey, we you know, I had an awesome talk, it didn't get accepted. This is a uh, essentially an, like an extended KubeCon uh, where a lot of these talks that 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 didn't get accepted. Um, can get that. And this is really community drawn, run grassroots. It's really fun to actually see this come together. So huge fan of the Rejects conference. Um, and uh, what they're doing there, I don't know. I'm going to have to see if I can actually get in early and be able to do that. I don't think I've bought uh, all my tickets yet. Um, and then if you're a contributor or would like to be a contributor, then we have the Contributor Summit. And so this is, um, this is for folks not just using Kubernetes, but actually helping to make Kubernetes better. And there's really two tracks to this. And George, uh, well, actually, no, George hasn't been super involved this time. Paris and the Contributor Experience SIG has been driving a lot of this. Um, but there's one track, which is current contributors in terms of like organizing, making decisions, um, being able to sort of, you know, have teaching sessions for how things work, and then new contributors. There's a whole effort around sort of like, how do we make it easier for folks to figure out how to be effective, how to get involved in Kubernetes. So if you're gonna be at KubeCon, and you want to learn, you know, uh, uh, about how to become a contributor, that's a great place to go. And so um, please check that out. Um, let's see. So etcd 3.4 is coming, announced, which is super exciting. So um, really great to see that this is, you know, development in etcd is continuing to pick up. And I think what we've seen is an effective handoff from etcd from being a, core OS, Red Hat thing to something that is really being community driven. Um, uh, for me, it's really great to see that, you know, folks can often move around the industry between different companies, but they can also continue to, to, to essentially invest in project like etcd. And I think, you know, and looking at this from the point of view of the CNCF, seeing projects sort of transcend that sort of vendor uh, uh, focus is really, really good. Um, and so, and there's a lot of improvements coming in etcd. Uh, um, 3.4 that is really going to help with Kubernetes scalability and efficiency. So um, there we go. Uh, and so here's a here's a big summary snapshot, uh, a blog post on that. Um, cluster API, we're big fans of Cluster API here at VMware, putting a lot of work into that. Uh, um, V1 Alpha 2 is out or is about to be out. Is it out, out? Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of improvements, a lot of lessons learned there. And then Duffy says that uh, etcd 3.4 will likely merge in with Kubernetes 1.17. Um, and so something to look forward to there. Um, and so cluster API stuff is making progress. Really great to see that moving forward. Um, the endpoint slice API is coming in 1.16. This is not something that I've dug into. So I have not, 
um, there's a cap on this that goes into this. My assumption here, I haven't, I need to learn about this. My assumption is the goal here is to actually be able to uh, get updates to endpoints in a much more efficient way. So this is an efficient way to get that because these are one of the most heavily uh, trafficked resources in Kubernetes. So it's probably a big efficiency thing. Um, yeah, uh, but this is not something I've looked at. So this is actually exciting to see uh, endpoints continue to move forward. Um, one of the things we don't have here, but I'm really excited that's landing in 1.16 is dual stack support. I was, uh, I was down at a thing in San Francisco yesterday talking with Tim Hawken, who leads SIG Network, super, um, uh, 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 you know, long-term, like pretty much, you know, uh, OG Kubernetes. And, uh, and uh, we were talking about the, the, the dual stack support, and it's actually more than that. Their work was done, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Carl was driving it, and I'm, I'm trying to remember who else was, was really driving this uh, from, from Microsoft, but uh, working with Tim and the community to be able to take, like we made a mistake early on with Kubernetes with things like pod definitions, where we only assumed that there was gonna be one IP address, one interface and essentially pluralizing all the networking resources across all of the resources and figuring out how do we gracefully actually move from the old and the new different ways of, of, of representing these resources. Lots of tricky API issues there to make that happen, but that work is finally landing. It's been an, an enormous amount of work, and so that's actually really cool to see that happening. Um, so that's you know, networking related here. Let's see, an overview of cron jobs um, from I don't know, I don't want to pay for, for medium. Um, so this looks really interesting using uh, kittens. So it's, I uh, uh, hadn't seen this yet. This is super cool. Um, and I think it's gonna be interesting to look at sort of cron jobs versus some of the pipeline stuff and how these relate as we look at Tecton. Um, great primer of Kubernetes on the edge. Uh, talking about some of, the, some of the things to think about here. Edge infrastructure versus edge devices versus sensors, different like ways to deploy Kubernetes. Um, I haven't looked at this too closely. I'm hoping that uh, folks aren't suggesting that you connect nodes over WAN links because I think that's a bad idea. But <laughs> um, uh, Kubernetes security audit. Um, uh, let's see. And so yeah, so Tim uh, and I believe Kyle will be giving a keynote at KubeCon about the dual stack support. So. So that's super excited, exciting to see that stuff coming. Um, let's see, uh, the security audit, Kubernetes security audit, security audit some really good um, data here and some good takeaways. Um, you know, we're, learn, we're, we're learning, we're improving. You know, I was at this um, yeah, Enterprise TechCrunch event uh, yesterday, you know, like I said, with Tim and Brendan was there and, um, and um, uh, and, you know, and one of the questions that came up was like, hey, what's up with Kubernetes security? And, you know, and, and I think, I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it was, was, was Tim, who's like, well, you know, security is not a binary thing. It's really a journey. And so, you know, I'm really excited to see us that we're continuing to invest in Kubernetes security and, and improving things. Um, and then for those who are part of the community, the Kubernetes election is underway. This is for the Kubernetes steering committee, which essentially helps to guide a lot of the governance structure of Kubernetes. Um, so there's a post here in, uh, or this is a Google Groups thing that George sent out. He's helping to run the run this about the schedule and how this stuff works. So if you're a contributor to Kubernetes, um, this is something you should be aware of, and you know it's a way for you to to make sure that you know you have. Uh, your influence in terms of the direction of where Kubernetes is going. Um, so I'm on the steering committee now, but after this election, I won't be. So <laughs> it's really exciting to see, you know, the project be be handed off to 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 folks who've really, you know, put time and effort and passion into the community. Um, oh, it's it's I'm doing Purple Monster, Brian. Um, and then um, and then and then Duffy just added this thing talking about. Uh, how does cube control exec work in detail, which looks really exciting. Um, Cause this is one of the more complicated flows with things like, um, like I'm sure like, you know, we're doing like uh, web sockets and stuff like that and speedy and stuff like that. So that's looks like a really cool in depth analysis there. All right. <sighs> All right. So that's me getting through the notes really fast, trying to get um, through this as much as possible so that we can dig into Tecton. A lot of news to catch up on 
both between KubeCon and and the uh, stuff coming in 1.16 and uh, the stuff that we're excited from the from the VMware point of view. So uh, hopefully, if you want to dig into any more of that, the links are in the notes. Um, okay, let's start with Tecton. Um, so Tecton is, I'll give you a little bit of project history and, you know, and, and folks who know better, you know, please correct me if I got any of this stuff wrong. And again, we have, you know, Jason is, uh, is on the line here in the comments helping us out and, uh, and Christy also, uh, both Tecton contributors. And so they can correct me when, uh, when I get this stuff wrong. So Tecton is kind of a, a spinoff of the Knative project. And so Knative originally was really essential. Let's break down the, the, the serverless uh, experience into, um, into a bunch of component pieces. Um, and, uh, and one of those pieces was how do we build and deploy? Another one was how do we do like zero to one auto scaling? How do we do like things like build packs? Uh, things like eventing. These are all things that sort of make up sort of serverless. And instead of viewing this as sort of one monolithic project, Knative always saw these things as largely separable. And the build stuff, some of the build stuff was so separable that it actually got split out into a separate project or at least, you know, inspired a separate project but turned into Tecton. Uh, and Tecton itself is not part of the CNCF. It's part of this other foundation called the CDF, the Continuous Delivery Foundation. There has been some hand wringing and uh, and drama around sort of CDF versus CNCF, but at the end of the day, I think it's a great sign to see Google uh, continue, continue to contribute at least some open source projects into a foundation so that we can make sure that there's a continue uh, uh, community ownership of these things over time. So it's really cool to see that happen. Um, so that being said, Tecton's still a relatively young project. Um, and you can tell because you go to the official web page and it's like, go, go to GitHub. <laughs> so we can go to GitHub and, uh, and, and then GitHub's like, okay, go to the, de to the official page. <laughs> no, but like, I think, you know, it's still one of those things where the pretty page isn't up yet and all, all the real nitty gritty is happening in the GitHub, um, in the GitHub repo. Um, let's see. And so there's a, there's an org and look, oh, it looked like there's like a CLI and stuff and triggers and dashboard. But the main thing I think is the pipeline repo, it looks like. Um, so yeah, I haven't seen all this yet. So I'm still figuring all this out. So I am relatively new to this. I just had a chance to glance over stuff. I haven't had a chance to play with Tecton in detail. So I'm gonna be learning with the rest of all y'all. Um, so there we go. Okay, and then, oh man. The purple monster is very purple. Holy moly. Um, and so it's called, what is it called? It's called ultraviolet, yeah. Um, let's see, so um, uh, so traditionally when I've done TGIK, and I think each of us who does it differently, you know, will use sort of a different Kubernetes to work against. Um, I've used uh, uh, a cluster running on AWS. Um, but this time I'm actually going to be using Kind. And so this is my first time using Kind uh, for this type of use case. Um, and so I may, uh, I may hit my head up against issues with Kind uh, in addition to, to dealing with, um, uh, with Tecton. So, you know, two, two new things together, but, um, but we'll learn. Um, and then Seth saying, just got this running with Proud Triggers a few weeks ago. Jason was awesome in helping me to wire it in. Go Tecton. Awesome. So that's, that's what I love to see is that these things actually become part of a solution versus being like, here's like the whole thing. Um, and so I love to see that, hey, these, these things can wire in. Um, okay, so I have a kind cluster up and running. So I can do kind get. And one of the things that I was trying to dig into is that uh, Tecton is a pipeline for being able to do CI, CD types of stuff. One of the things that you do a lot of times with, with, with pipelines is that you'll have one stage of your pipeline produce an artifact, and you'll have another stage of the pipeline consume that artifact. And to do that, you need storage. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, and we'll get into the install instructions, but it looks like in terms of artifact storage, uh, Tecton supports either persistent volumes or uh, being able to upload to a Google Cloud storage bucket. Um, 
And and since like I have like kind and volumes is something that I'm still learning about. I think it works well as long as you're using a single node. When you go multi-node, things get a little bit more complicated. So we're going to be doing a uh, 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 a single node kind cluster is what I have here. So I can do kind get clusters, and then like I can do can I do that? No. How do I get more details? I guess, oh well, so we have a cluster. Um, uh, I can do Docker PS, you can see that it's a single cluster. And then I can do cube control get nodes, there we go. This has been running for about four hours. Oh, I can do kind get nodes, okay. It just gives you the name. All right, well anyways, we got a cluster up and running. We'll see if we hit our head up against anything. Um, hopefully this will work well. And um, and James was saying that he's uh, he's got kind working with a with uh, with Tecton, so we should be good there. Um, all right, so there we go. So now, like, I'm gonna be like, hey, here, let's install it. So I'm just we're gonna go through this together. The first thing you need is um, root or cluster admin on your cluster. Um, if you're running on GKE, this can be a little bit complicated with the way that like uh, GKE uh, uh, authentic, uh, authorization like intersects with RBAC. And so you may have to actually do uh, some of this type of stuff. Um, uh, but we already have a cluster, so we don't need to do that. And then the first thing that we do is we can go ahead and actually apply it. Um, and we're going to be doing a cube control apply against some random YAML. Um, and uh, let's see. So, oh, you know what I'm gonna? Okay. So I, I'm gonna do. Sorry. Uh, I'm gonna do a curl, and let's look at this. Oh, what? What? VS Code. I I had to blow away my homebrew uh, setup, and I think my like my code command line. Let's see. Um, sorry, give me a second here. I want to install. So with VS Code, can I do? How do you install the like the CLI helpers? Do y'all know? No, it's in my then code will work. No, I mean, it, you have to, there's something that you have to do to actually have it do that. To actually make it. Oh, here, yeah, here. Install shell integration. No, that's not it. All right, I'll mark, mark with this later. Command shift P. P. Install code command into path. There we go. Does that do it? Restart to update now. All right. I'm out of, I, I have old old stuff installed. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. So now we have code release.yaml. Let's see what do we have going on here. A lot of stuff. Um, Actually, here's what I'm gonna do. Let's look at the proof. So we have, oh wow, we're even doing like a pod security policy on this stuff. Um, a cluster role for Tecton Pipelines admin. And this thing can essentially get list, create updates, secrets. So it pretty much is cluster root. Um, all right, and then we have a service account in the Tecton pipelines and a role binding of that to the admins. Okay, so we're essentially creating a cluster admin role account in the Tecton pipelines. Uh, so this is something that I always have a hard time with is that like, I would love to see a way for these things to be installed in a sort of more localized way. It always scares me when I see like, oh, hey, we have a, we're installing a service account that gets root across everything. Um, it makes me feel like um, 
uh, you know, like we're creating another tiller. Now, not that we are, but like, you know, it's, it's something that always gives me a little bit of pause. And then we have a bunch of resource definitions. I like to see the resource definitions being installed via the YAML versus actually being installed on first run, because I think that means that you can take those permissions away later. And then um, let's see, and then we have an, another couple cluster roles. We have a service with a pipelines controller. Oh, we have a webhook service. And the webhook, okay. Uh, and then we have a config map, artifact buc bucket and artifact PVC. Do we want to install both of those things or do we want to actually install one? They're both null. And then tecton default with a default timeout. And then a config map for tecton pipeline. So we have a bunch of like Configy stuff going on here. Okay, Jason says that there's an operator here to help install this. Yes, I was just talking to somebody about this today. So let's take a look at at, at that operator. Do you think do you think Jason should I use that or should I just like slam the the YAML and and move on with my life? Is it worth uh? Is it worth doing that? Slam the YAML. Okay, we'll do that. All right, so we won't, the operator is really interesting because I think what we're starting to see is that like things like Istio or Tecton or, you know, these things can be complicated enough to config themselves that you end up with sort of a bootstrap installer operator that gets installed that then configures the, the larger system, which is really interesting. And then that starts to overlap with, well, do you use Helm or do you use an operator? Do you use Helm to install the operator and then whatever? So slammel. Yeah, slammel. That's our new term when you just slam the YAML in. Um, so a lot going on here. All right, I'm going to do, uh, can we do cap? Let's try it and see if we can use cap to apply this. Um, uh, it would be cap. Uh, do, 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 do. What, what would the thing be? Deploy, um, release. Okay, deploy. We have to. I like cap and it shows us the preview. So let's see if we can actually make this work. Now I'm like losing. You have to give it a nap. And then a tecton does not slam all shirts. So I'm, I'm mixing. I'm mixing up projects here, but I haven't like uh, cap. But this this is o dash f. That was the flag I was looking for. All right, and so here, yeah, so this gives us a summary of all the stuff that we're gonna be deploying. Oh, Mr. Windsor, how's it going? So Michael here is actually the product manager, or at least one of the product manager overhead people for Tecton. And Michael and I worked together back in the day on Internet Explorer. So I started my career here um, <laughs> uh, working with Michael. Uh, and so he, he has a long and industrious and interesting career. All right, so this shows us what we're doing. So we're creating a bunch of CRDs. We're creating some cluster roles, uh, a namespace, uh, pod security policy, a lot of really interesting stuff, and then a bunch of like configs going on here. So let's just go ahead and we're gonna slam this in. I'll drink my purple drink. Ermagerd, that's right. The whole team is there. So, oh, is Kim part of the part of the team also? All right. So there we go. Cube control get uh, namespaces, and we now have Tecton pipelines, and we're we're off to the races here. And so now you see why I like Cap. Isn't that cool? That's much better than Cube control apply. It gives you all this stuff, and then actually when you do a further deploy, it actually tells you. Um, it also tells you where, what the diffs are so that you actually have a much better idea of what's going on. All right, so um, we're not gonna do the operator. We'll, we'll skip that for now. 
Um, so we got that going on. And then we talked about resources and artifacts. How do you share artifacts uh, between things? And so, um, so we have to configure a persistent volume. And so when looking through the YAML here, and, I, and, and so to be clear, like I think the install instructions could be clear here. I think I know what I'm doing, but I think what I can do here is I can find, there's a config map here for the artifact. So it says create one called config artifact PVC here. And then the data, right now it's null, but it's saying that you want to create size five gigabytes and then storage class name. So I think I can do size uh, five gigabytes. We'll do that by default. And then um, cube control get storage class. And I think we have one called standard. And this is the stuff built in to um, uh, built into uh, uh, kind, which is a standard is what we have here. Um, so if I do that, then I think we're good to go. And now if I do the like the the cap deploy again, now it's like, hey, here's what's going to change. Um, and it says, okay, we're changing the artifact. And then, oh, this is interesting. I think it thinks it's going to do an update to the controller and the webhook. And I wonder what those updates actually look like. Can we do like a deep diff? I wonder why. Can we do a. Diff changes. Yeah, okay. Oh, this might be a, a bug with cap because we're redeploying this and it's actually all the defaulting is actually confusing things. All right. Interesting. All right. We'll, uh, is cap becoming a standard cubectal? I don't think so. I mean, like cap is really, I would love to see more folks, um, start to use cap because I think it does provide a better experience, but, um, you know, I'm not sure how much interaction has been between that team and the and the SIG CLI Cube Control folks. Um, I think this stuff will also get interesting with server side apply, which is this whole other. It's probably too deep to go into right now about sort of like how do we actually deal with merging changes from different places into a into a single resource. Um, all right, cool. So we got that up and running. So did I do the right thing there in terms of being able to, you know, the Tecton team in, in terms of being able to configure that? I guess we'll see as we go, but hopefully that was the right thing to do. Um, all right, so now I think we got things set up, but what did we set up? I think that's the big question. So we're gonna go through the tutorial here. Actually, so before we go into tutorial, I just looked at the docs and this is the thing that I think, or let's read this, okay. so. Um, Tecton pipelines are cloud native. They run on Kubernetes. Kubernetes clusters as a, as a first class type and then use containers as building blocks. So that all sounds great. Um, I think not just cloud native, but Kubernetes native uh, in terms of working with things like RBAC and namespaces and all that instead of working against it. Pipelines are decoupled. So you can use one pipeline to can deploy to any Kubernetes cluster. So you can have your test deploy thing and that can deploy to your production cluster. So you're not necessarily running a bunch of your sort of build deploy infrastructure on the same cluster that you're actually running your workloads on. I think one of the things that I think from the point of view of sort of like original Kubernetes folks that caught us by surprise is that, um, you know, inside of Google, Borg clusters are huge and uh, they're centrally managed by, by Borg SRE. And they're very much sort of multi-tenant or multi-team, at least, uh, across all the users. And so you'll have search running next to Gmail, running next to MapReduce, running next to machine learning. All those things will, will be running on the same cluster. Um, and creating a new board cluster was like essentially buying a building. Uh, and so it was a big thing. Uh, but as we move to cloud, as we build Kubernetes, the original assumption with Kubernetes is, again, we were going to do these big bang clusters. 
Uh, but once GKE went out there and once we started automating a lot of the setup and teardown, all of a sudden folks started seeing clusters as these mutable things also. And so we moved from a world inside of Google where you have these like big ass clusters to a world where clusters tend to be uh, more single purpose. Um, and, um, and so, uh, or at least they can be. And so people definitely view clusters as more mutable. And so I think we're starting to see that the tools are adapting to deal with this multi-cluster world. And I think the fact that the Tecton works cross-cluster is a great example of that. So Jeffrey says, uh, Cap, like providing lots of insights like Terraform. Yeah, yeah, so that's why I like Cap. And we did, I did an episode on Cap a little while ago and YTT, which is a, uh, a templating solution that is, is complementary. Um, so that's cool. Okay, um, and then uh, Tecton pipelines are, are typed. So the concept of type resources mean that any that for a resource such as image, implementations can easily be swapped out. Um, I, I, I'm interested, is this using some of the sort of duct typing stuff that is sort of more endemic of, of Knative? I'd love to hear and see more about that. All right, and then as we go, and if we just look at the, the docs, I'll look at docs at head. Um, it looks like the main objects, whenever I'm looking at a system like this, I'm like, what are the nouns? So the nouns we have here, we have pipelines and pipeline runs. So a pipeline is just a, a thing that can be triggered and it runs to completion. So it's kind of a little bit like a task, but it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and Jason's saying that this does use some of the duct typing, uh, or Christy's also saying that uh, uh, using some of the Knative package stuff and shared libs, and, and, but they want to do more in the future. So yeah, the duct typing stuff is super interesting. I think it's really, really cool. Um, and uh, might be worth doing an episode on on, on that. Um, okay, uh, or at least, you know, I did have pointed at, like I think Vile and, and, and uh, I don't know who else did a talk on duct typing at, at the last KubeCon. And then there's tasks, which are the individual things that are part of a pipeline, um, cohesive and loosely coupled, and then you have task runs. Uh, tasks can depend on artifacts and parameters created by other tasks. So it seems like tasks are kind of like a Kubernetes job, but with sort of more interface information about inputs and outputs. Um, and then pipelines are a thing that string together a bunch of tasks. Um, then tasks can be invoked via task runs. And then pipeline resources are those artifacts that get pushed around between them. Um, and then there's like, how to create a new pipeline and but let's go through the tutorial because I think this is the sort of much more detailed, but I think for this type of thing, going through the tutorial makes a ton of sense. Um, tutorial will walk you through creating simple task pipeline and running them by creating tasks running task pipeline. We're gonna create a hello world task and then a hello world pipeline. Um, okay, so a task defines the work that needs to be executed. For example, the following is a simple task that will echo hello world. All right, so we'll do that. Um, uh, Tecton tutorial. Uh, and we're going to call this uh, hello task. Uh, and, uh, and let me close this window. And if all works well, I can do code and magic happens. Okay, cool. And we'll just put this on here. So what do we have? So this is pretty simple. Um, so a task, metadata, uh, a spec, have a set of steps, name, image, command, and arg. So this is like a simplified pod template. So one of the questions that I have here is, um, is, you know, we did things with pods so that you could have multiple containers working together. As we look at things like this, do we have a way to actually sort of implement sidecars or initializers or that type of thing with this? Um, and so like, if you look at something like Istio, Istio will run a webhook for being able to inject sidecars. And so you can definitely have like a, 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 an admission controller, mutating admission controller that can inject a sidecar 
uh, for you in a transparent fashion, but I think there's times when you want to sort of manually inject the sidecar as part of sort of your build config pipeline also instead of actually having something doing that at runtime. And so Jason's saying, okay, sidecar support just landed. You can specify sidecars, siblings to steps. Okay, so that's interesting. So then there's a recognition that you have sort of your your main container, and then you have a bunch of sidecars. Whereas I think Kubernetes in general, when you look at a pod, there is no idea of the main container. All containers are kind of equal in that in that level. Um, and I think maybe it's, it would be interesting to think about like what would it look like if we did define the idea of a main container in Kubernetes pods, what would that actually help us with? Um, but I could see for something like Tacton where you want to actually be able to judge, it's much easier to judge success and failure and stuff like that. Um, startup shutdown, like the sidecar kind of runs forever, but you know, hey, when the main container shuts down, then you probably want to pull down and actually declare that the task is done. So yeah, there's some sticky issues with respect to sidecars and things like jobs for sure. Okay, so Jason's saying that we can do some of that. So, all right, so this is just going to do an echo hello world. Um, yeah, so sidecars are killed when the step's complete. Uh, sidecar adapter ambassadors, exactly. Uh, um, okay, so if I have multiple steps, do they, do they run sequentially inside of, a, inside of a task? Do they share, like... You know, so name. So I assume I can do something like that. Um, I'm kind of like curious about the breakdown of steps inside of a task and then tasks inside of a pipeline. Okay, they run sequentially in the same pod. Okay. Sharing an empty during volume at workspace. Okay, so the idea here is that it's kind of like a pod, but with sequentiality built into it. Um, so that's actually cool. All right. Where you assume that you're using the same footprint, sharing stuff between these things is really easy, whereas sharing stuff between different tasks will be much more heavyweight. And uh, you'll see a lot more composability between tasks than within a task, I'm assuming. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, so there we go, we got that. And then a task run runs the task you define. Here's a simple example. Um, so, so this is interesting. Um, okay, just like quick feedback on the tutorial. You, you know, and this is like, you write an O'Reilly book and they drill this type of stuff in into you, um, is that, uh, you know, if you're gonna give a code sample, give it a file name and then, um, and then when you do the apply, make sure you reference that file name. Um, I know exactly what's going on here, but like it's, you know, it's gonna be a little bit trickier for others to figure this out. Cause here, hello task, okay, so we'll do a new file low task run.yaml and we'll go ahead and we'll do that and uh task ref is echo hello world and so this is a single run of these things okay so um okay pipelines are how you do multiple parallel task runs okay so that's how you start doing sort of the graph on this stuff oh look at that michael's like delegating already okay yeah, I mean, how you actually do the sequential stuff within a pod is going to be interesting. I'm definitely going to going to be looking at that. Okay, so uh, so now I can do cap, or I'll just do cube control apply dash f hello task. So so the hello task is sort of the schema. It's kind of like the class, whereas like the run is the instance. Um, so now if I do cube control get uh, tasks, do I do that? I get that. Um, and then I can do, um, oh, here's what I want to try. Do I have, I did blow away. Okay. Uh, brew install octant. We can use this to explore what we got going on. Okay. So octant and, and, um, and Brian did a, Brian did a TGIK on this, is essentially a uh, dashboard-ish type of thing. It's sort of a visual cube control to some degree. 
And so we should see uh, custom resources. Here we have, uh, yeah, here we have Echo Hello World. And we can see, we can see, okay, wh what gets added there and what gets updated. Okay. And the relationship between these things. Okay, cool. Or the Tekton dashboard is a good way. So here's okay. So here's my problem with dashboards that run on the cluster, and this is one of our one of our, the things that we thought about with with Octan is that when you run a dashboard, that dashboard runs with credentials, and then you have to scope the credentials. There becomes this credentialing problem where you either have to pass your credentials through, which becomes a pain in the butt, or you have to try and match up or whatever. And so if you are dealing with RBAC and scoping things down, dashboards always get really really complicated. And so that's why you know I think you know. Um, Octan is, is, from our point of view, really interesting because it actually reuses your local credentials. Um, actually, and let me start this in the, in the background here. Uh, if I do this, oh, that's, I think I, oh man, I had a session. How do I create a new, there we go. There's my profile. Uh, Find get cube config path uh, and do uh, export cube config equals uh, octant. There we go. All right, so we'll just leave this running in the background here, and, and we'll see what's happening. Um, so one of the things, if you all are, are up to it, I'd love to see. There's a plugin model for for octant. I'd love to see us. Uh, um, having like things like a Tekton specific set of plugins for Octan, um, which would be really, really cool. Oh, and Jason's saying, hey, started looking at that already. Um, Graph is support out of the box and all that. Yeah, so that's super cool. Okay, but um, we're, that, I have this done. We can look at the, the, if we have time, we can look at the Tekton dashboard. Okay, but now I can do uh, cube control apply dash F uh, hello task run dot YAML. So this created it um, and and we can look, okay, task runs. All right, so status, okay, and we got, there's the task run, which is actually, we have some pods. Those pods are orange, so something weird is going on. We're probably downloading the Ubuntu image. Oh, bottom of the terminal is cut off. Okay, let me go back, sorry about that. Oh, you know that happens when I when I created the new tab. So, um, so I use this Mac utility called Moom, and I have a I have a uh, uh, a quick key for essentially shrinking the window just so it works just right for for Kubernetes or for TGIK. Okay, so we have this. Um, okay, it succeeded, and uh, we have an event that goes with it. This is actually really cool. Um, and then if we want to look, there's the resource viewer and the relationship. And what we can see here is that the YAML says uh, has a condition uh, called succeeded that's set to true. And so this actually is really interesting. And this is something I want to call attention to. This is some of the duck typing type of stuff that is is one of the patterns being driven by Knative, which is the idea that we have conditions and we have a standard set of sort of like uh, schema for conditions. And the idea is that um, uh, they have three states, unknown, true, and false. Uh, true is good, false is bad, unknown is unknown, and then there's things like succeeded or or um, or you know ready that are standard things for like hey this thing has actually sort of hit some sort of terminal point. Um, so that's actually pretty cool. And so um, we can see here, okay, here's the steps out of each of these things that are completed when they actually completed, and and I think if we go back to um, to the tutorial, there we have the output. Now, one of the things that I know y'all spend a lot of time on is how do you actually get logs of these things? But I think maybe pipelines, how do I know if it said hello world? Logging, okay. Logs can remain in memory only as opposed to a receiver such as stack driver. See docs and getting logs from runs. How do we do that? Get crap pod name. 
Okay, so then we just go through and we actually sort of look at the logs and you can get the specific container. So let's see if we can actually see that from Octant. So we can go through and look at the resource viewer, find the, oh, we don't hyperlink to this, Brian. So we have a pod there. Okay, this is another thing, Brian, that we probably want to do. I don't know if you're listening, man, is like being able to see essentially, you know, historic pods or, okay, the CLI. Yeah, I'd love to like understand the CLI, the, the Tecton CLI. Um, logs are available via the underlying pod. There's a CLI, which will stream logs to you from the pod. But is the pod gone now at this point? Oh, no, it's in completed state. Okay, so it looks like this may be a thing with Octant where we actually don't show completed pods. So that's probably something. All right, so let's um, let's go through and and see if we can. Uh, Let's see. So, okay. So let's, let's do it two ways. Okay. So uh, we have the pod here. So we can do a cube control, um, logs, uh, let's see. So this, and it's going to tell me which one do you want? We want step echo and it's going to say there is a hello world and hello again. And I think we don't need to do the dash P because we don't have a new run. It's like the latest run is what it actually shows. Um, so it does run on top of Kubernetes jobs. Okay. But the jobs are gone, but the pods are still there. All right, cool. All right, so, so this went through and it ran those things sequentially inside the same pod, which I think is interesting. Um, I'm going to do, so let's look at this. Oh, I can't look at the pod in Octant. Okay, cube control, get pods. Um, cube control, get pod. That dash O YAML. What do we have going on here? Let's look beneath the covers and see the magic. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have one container here. which isn't, okay, so we have a, have a container. The args are wait file, post file, wait file, entry, okay, hello world, boom, 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 with a bunch of, of this stuff. And then, okay, and so that is, that's the Ubuntu image. And then eventually, echo hello world. Okay, so, Builder tools entry point. Okay. Okay, I get what's going on here. This is fascinating. All right, so what we have is that there's a there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of magic going on here. Um, but basically, what happens is um, each of the containers they they inject some binaries into this. Uh, via volume mount, and then they essentially use utilities from that volume to be able to uh, coordinate sort of startup of things across different containers. And so we see, well, I don't know. So where does builder tools come from? That's the name of that volume is tools. It's an empty dir, and that probably gets populated by an init container, it looks like. So that's a creds init type of thing. And there's co in there somewhere too. Okay. So that's that's a little bit uh, that's a little bit of magic going on there. Um, really look, yeah, I really look to see how the, the, the sausage is made. Um, I mean Christy's gonna be giving a KubeCon talk to actually dig in a little bit deeper. So this is why I'm guessing you all are using the Ubuntu container instead of something like the Alpine container, because you probably want to assume that you have some stuff in the in the image which is something I was wondering. Okay, so so okay, so okay, the, the thing that we're seeing here is that if you look at the pod, there's some voodoo going on here to be able to bootstrap secrets 
to, uh, to be able to inject the right types of binaries and to be able to make sure that it can do the sequencing and coordination between runs of steps within a single pod, but doing that in a way where you can still bring your own container to some degree. Um, okay, Jason is saying that Alpine works too. Everything we need is populated by the ITNIC container. Uh, so yeah, so that's really clever. I think it speaks to how flexible Kubernetes is. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's pretty cool. Okay, so, um, so we got logs, we're good. Um, and we can continue on with the tutorial here. Um, okay, task inputs and outputs. Alpine edge, okay, yeah. Um, in the most common scenarios, the task needs to uh, needs multiple steps with input and output uh, resources properties. For example, a task could fetch source code from GitHub repository and build a Docker image from it. Pi pipeline resources are used to define the artifacts that can be passed in and out of a task. There are a few system-defined resources types ready to use. The Git resource represents a Git repository with a specific version. All right, so here, the scaffold, we're just using that as an example Git repo. We're not doing anything super specific with scaffold. Um, let's see. But if we have a UI functional test CICD pipeline, we need a kind virtual machine with VMC. Okay, so here's something interesting. We're looking at doing something like kubevert as, <laughs> as actually being a resource that you can orchestrate uh, for VMs. And so, yeah, I think launching and managing VMs as part of, the, part of these things is not totally crazy either. Um, okay, so we're using scaffold just as an example as a Git repo. Um, and then we're also taking in an image, which is a GCR image. Leroy, this is one, of, I think this is part of the, the scaffold tutorial. And then we can talk about build and push and stuff like that. All right, so let's let's play around with this. Okay, so we have this thing here, and we're gonna do uh, we'll do a new file. We'll call call this um, artifacts.yaml, and we have um, so we have that, and then and then we have another one. Oh, use your project. Okay, so let me, um, it's gonna be interesting. Credentials get interesting here. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's play around with this. We'll figure out how this works. Um, um, let's use GCR just to be safe. Um, let me, I'm going to switch to my face here while I actually see, cause I didn't, wasn't planning on using Google. So I have to do uh, Google DCP cons. I'm tempted to say, Hey, let's use Amazon, but I'll be nice. Let me log in and make sure I'm at the right one here. What project are we talking about here? This, and then if I do... Where is, here, I'll switch back. Um, where is GCR? Container registry, okay. And I have all sorts of random leftover stuff. I have a Hypercube from 2017. Yeah, you can tell I haven't used this in a while. Um, <laughs> um, and so, okay, cool. Uh, we have settings and stuff. Okay, so this is fine. Um, so we can use, this is JB to Heptio is the, is the thing there. So we can go back here and my project will be JB to Heptio. Um, now the question, okay, so we'll do this. Good enough, but credentials end up being a really tricky thing when it comes to these things. So let's see how that works. Cube control. Uh, cube control apply dash f artifacts. So those things are up and running. 
Um, let's go back to the tutorial. And then here we have a task called build Docker image from git source. And we're going to uh, touch build image.yaml. Build image.yaml. We're going to go ahead and do this. OK. So what do we got here? Can you all see this? Is this big enough for you all? Let me know if this is too small to read. Um, so we have a task, and that task has uh, inputs. OK, so one input here is uh, the thing called Docker source of type git. And so I want to look at the artifact again. So the type is so 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 the CRD is just pipeline resource, but there's a type there. So we don't actually have, and then these things end up being just key value pairs and stuff. Okay. So this is this is like a subtype. I mean, you could also go down the path where you create a CRD per type of resource, but I think that becomes problematic when you want people to be able to define new things and you really need sort of cluster admin to define new CRDs. So, um, so this is a duck typing type of thing, perhaps. Yeah, I think this is a place where you can use duck typing, where you could either have this generic pipeline resource, or you could have more strongly typed things that follow patterns that you can use. All right. So, um, so we have the build image task. Actually, let's rename this. Can I uh, rename it to build image task? OK. Um, Uh, okay, and then we have a path, path to the Docker file, and so this is workspace Docker source Docker file. Okay, I'm wondering, and then we have path to context. Oh, so these are the inputs, okay. And then we have path to context, which is the build context used by Canico, um, or Docker source, okay, and so. Uh, so anytime you do a build of a Docker file, it takes things from your local directory and actually, you know, local environment and uses that. When you do a Docker build behind the scenes, it essentially captures all the data it needs, tars that up, and then sends that to the Docker daemon so that it can actually run the build process. Um, Conoco, which is this sort of, I don't know if we did an episode on Conoco, essentially goes through and, and makes it more explicit what that context is. And so this is the context that you're using. I assume that this will actually sort of tar this thing up here. And then it outputs an image. Um, and then uh, the steps here on the task are uh, build and push, where we are, the image we're running is the Conoco project executor. Specify Docker config is required to allow Conoco to detect Docker credentials. So this is the thing that I'm confused about. Where is it going to actually get this? And how do I actually modify and start mounting secrets and stuff like that into my task? Um, uh, maybe that's in the run? I don't know. And then command, we're going to just execute. Con uh, and then inputs, params. OK, so this sort of interpolation syntax, this is something that Cube Control, I believe, does, where we're actually pulling the params through. Or no, this has to be, this has to be a task-specific thing. I don't think Kubernetes knows how to interpolate that. Yeah, so, so Jason's saying that the tutorial is missing setting up the creds. Jason, if you could help me out here and just sort of like, you know, put some stuff in the, in the, um, in the chat, like that'll get me going, because I could kind of fumble my way through it. But, um, I'm happy to actually quickly go through and actually create a, a service account and, and get that into a secret and do that when you all aren't looking. Um, all right, so these are the, the inputs and the outputs. So you can essentially use those as arguments in your steps, uh, which is cool. This is very, it's, it's interesting. This is very Google-esque to actually add more and more stuff as command line flags. Whereas I think a lot of folks outside of Google would actually do this stuff using, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff outside of Google that, that uh, uh, would use environment variables. All right, so let's um, go through. And then we have a task run here, and we'll see what we're missing out of the task run and how we actually bind all this stuff together. So uh, new file, build image task run.yaml. 
So task run, the resource, here's where we actually bind in scaffold git, and we say, okay, the path to the Docker file is just gonna be Docker file. And I assume that that's relative to the Docker source. Path to context is workspace Docker source. Examples, microserver Leroy, Leroy Web. That's cool. And then the output is gonna be the resource that we had here that we already defined. So there, this is our output resource. Yeah, and so understanding like the, the secrets flow through this actually gets really, really uh, complicated. Okay, uh, so basically create a service account, give it a secret, annotate this as a Docker cred, and then run, uh, and then run the task run as the service account. Okay, so let's go through and we'll fumble our way through this. Cube control, create SA uh, task run. Um, so we have that service account. Um, I have to create a secret, so let me go through and um, uh, GCR Docker uh, Kubernetes secret and see if I can find the way using GCR with some random container solutions. Oh, look, we have a Heptio thing here. We wrote this a while ago. This may be out of date. Um, <laughs> um, so create an image pull secret, container... All right, so, so what I need to do is I need to start with enabling container registry API and um, did all that. JSON key, okay, I have to create a service account key and give it permissions and, whew, okay. Um, let me go ahead and I'm gonna take you all uh, let's see, I'm gonna take you all off here and you're gonna, you're gonna watch me be surprised. I'll talk through what I'm doing. Um, okay, so we got, uh, so you go to API and services, credentials, um, create a credential, a service account key. Oh, I think it won't flash this stuff on the screen. I think we can do this without flashing on the screen. We'll see. I'll delete it afterwards. Um, So the service account, oh, I had one that was read only before. Um, well, we had to create a new service account. So let's create a new service account. Where would that be? Oh, oh manage service accounts, there we go. And I can do a create a service account. I'm gonna call this one a GCR read write. Uh, create. Select a role, I have no idea. Let's see, this is probably cloud. I Let me talk about how, what I think about GCR IAM. I mean, you know, nobody's in love with AWS IAM, but like, my God, at least like, you know, okay, filter registry. Nope, GCR, nope. I have to be, okay, so now GCR is actually, I think, so now I'm like, okay, uh, uh, GCS role for GCR. Project editor nuclear option. I know, right? Like configuring access control for GCR. And I think, okay, you just need essentially storage admin for this stuff. And this comes back to the history of the way that GCR is actually backed by cloud storage, uh, storage admin, which is sucks because I actually only want to do it for a particular bucket. But with AWS IAM, I can actually restrict this as, with a policy document that at least I know how to write, but okay, I'm sorry. YouTube is not sending my messages that have links in them. I'm not seeing them. I'm sorry, Christy. If you, um, if you need to send links, um, you can, um, you can add them to the, to the, um, uh, to the notes. Um, and I have been approving the URLs as I've been seeing them come up for sure. Okay, so storage admin, continue with GCR, and uh, create key, JSON key, uh, private key stored to my computer, um, show in Finder, 
maybe. Okay, so this is my downloads. Okay, so now I can do copy uh, down JD to Heptio. All right, so now that's my key. I'm not going to cat that to the screen because that's bad news. So now I go back to this thing here. I got that. And I can do this JSON key. And then I need to do uh, what? 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 I think we're going to do gcr.io. This username thing is like leftover, or the email is leftover from like the dawn of time. This is somewhat nasty because um, this will actually show up in my history with the full key on it. But, you know, YOLO. Um, all right, so we have that. Now the next thing we need to do is add that secret to the service account. Um, Uh, and that is, we just do secrets and then where image pull secrets. There we go, like that. Okay. So we'll cube, control, edit, SA, what do we, what did we call it? Cube, control, get. So we can do that. Image pull secrets and GCR JSON key, right? Name. Well, Roy saying that. Uh, Skips history if you start a command with a blank space before the command. Oh, that's a good tip. I like that. That's cool. All right, so there we go. Now I have a service account. Okay, now the question is, how do I actually go through and actually say I want to use that service account in uh, build image task run? Is it in task run? Is there a way to actually say... Tecton service count. Will you do? I don't think Kaneko knows how to understand service accounts. Oh, that won't work then? Shoot. Or map the secrets in. Pipeline auth. Let's see. Exposing credentials. Git config. SSH. Basic. Forget. Docker. Okay, so we have a secret. User pass or... Okay, so this should secret. Okay, this is a different account. Okay, Christy, put the link to the docs where I should be looking in the notes here. Um, oh man, we have a Slammel t-shirt already? Holy moly. Um, Okay, I am looking at that. Okay, cool. There we go. I'm looking at it. Sorry. Okay, off with Conoco. Okay, so here, all right, we are down the rabbit hole. So we create a secret, a generic secret with Conoco, and then, and then we can just go rename it Conoco Secret dot JSON. Okay. So 
So I can do that. We'll go through. All right, download a JSON key for the service account, rename the key to blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, all right, so we have that. <laughs> uh, read from that bucket. And this, so this is running through like different ways of doing this. Okay, so now, um, so now we're doing Conoco. So we have the Conoco secret but we have to actually map that as a volume and get that in there. And so that's the thing that I'm wondering about. So here we have this. So we have a secret name type. It's not basic auth. Kubernetes. Well, this is a Docker config JSON. I'm sorry, folks, I'm struggling here. Um, Put it at the bottom. Okay, just replace HTTP with something else like HTTP. Kind of go with a local Docker registry also. Okay, so this is the thing. Okay, so this is my, so this is one of the things I'm struggling with right here is that I don't understand the schema for whether this has, this secret should show up in task or task run. I'm assuming it's task run, but it could be task also, but I'm assuming it's task run. And in any case, we're actually looking at Docker config here in builderhome.docker. I'm wondering how do we actually, what is the right format there and how do I inject that using, um, using Tecton? If you annotate the secret with a Docker annotation, use SA in your task run, Tecton will pre prepend steps to inject creds as a Docker config JSON to your workspace. So task run. Okay, so each step is a container spec. Okay, so I have the SA set up. I have it set up with the Docker, with the, with the, uh, um, the registry credentials. I just need to use the SA to configure the task run. So what is the schema for task run for, um, task runs for the service account. Okay, it's, it's just service account. Okay, so if I go through, so theoretically, if I go through here, and this is not inputs or outputs, this is actually optional inputs, outputs, because this is a top level thing here, and we can actually do um, count like this. And then what was my name of uh, cube control get SA was called task run. So that theoretically should work. Uh, and uh, so now if I do cube control apply dash F uh, with uh, build image task run Hilarity ensues. Let's see what we got going on here. Octane still running in the background here. And we should be able to look at task run. Task run resolution failed. So what did we get wrong here? Error when listing task for task run. Build Docker image from get source task run. Build Docker image from get source not found. Did I not install the task? Cube control apply dash F hello uh, build image task. I know. I think I forgot to do that. Okay. So now, will this thing actually, is this thing like, hey, I'm done or succeeded false? So this is a terminal condition. It won't try and resolve. So cube control get task runs. So cube control delete task run, um, we delete that, and now we can apply it again. And let's see. Containers with unwrite, not all steps, the tasks have finished executing. Uh, so we have the steps build and push completed. 
All right, so it looks like, did everything work? Spec status, uh, not all steps have finished executing. So it's still, so succeeded is unknown. We're not there yet. We're running. I should be a cube control get pods. My machine's starting to sound like a leaf blower, so something's happening. Cube. Uh, uh, brew, install, kale. Where's my utility? How do I install this? We're racing it. There we go. Oh yeah, uh, you know, Octant does automatically refresh and document does logs. I'm an idiot. Okay, so where it failed here You don't have the needed permissions to perform this operation. You may have invalid credentials. So, okay, so something wacky happened. Failed to push destination. No token in bearer response. So I don't know. So apparently the creds didn't work. Uh, I'm sorry, Christy, about the links. Um, all right, so let's see if we can figure out what happened here. Um, step credential, there's no logs there, okay. Oh, and there's like specialized importers and exporters based on types, and so this thing knows how to actually fetch GitHub commit ID and all that. Okay, so this thing knows how to like, okay, so we're grabbing scaffold. We were able to create the dir for the built image. There's a lot of convention going on here. I think one of the things I'd love to see is like talk about sort of like what are the different objects and sort of what does the convention mean around this? Because there's like magic happening like, oh, when I specify a Git source, then that means that XYZ gets injected. How do we extend that? Is that extensible? Or is it just that those types are built in? That type of thing. Um, basically, it does not make the link between the essay and the secrets. You must reference the secrets in the essay. I did, I thought... Did I forget to do that? Um, let's see if we can do that. So if I look at uh, custom RBAC role bindings, where's service accounts, service accounts, task run, image pull secret is G GCR JSON key. So I do actually have that. You must also add, okay. You must also add to the secret is the fact that it's for Docker with an annotation saying it is for Docker. Yeah, so I used that. So I'm going to flash this on the screen and y'all can like push stuff to my registry. But um, if I do uh, Canico secret here, you'll see that this is a service account here. Oh, that's that one. Okay. Uh, cube control get SA. No, get secret. You'll see that this is a Docker config JSON GCR key. Uh, cube control, get that. Oh, YAML. Um, and here you can see that this thing is a Docker config JSON um, that's been base64 encoded. Again, copy it off my screen. Uh, and uh, type is docker config json so it should know how to do that so i have okay so what i have here is i have a uh, image pull secret that's in the right format and marked as such i have that set as an image pull secret in the service account and then uh, i have that service account hooked up through tecton do i maybe have to um let me try Cube control, uh, let's do edit 
So let's do this, because right now it's an image pull secret. Maybe let's just make it a plain old secret. Secret GCR JSON key. Think that'll do it? Okay. Um, so now I can do delete, apply, do that again. We're gonna look at pods here. This thing's doing its thing. We can look at logs. Um, um, credential initializer, apparently, but like we can do step build and push. Okay, downloading the base image. So now are you all thinking about like, hey, can we opportunistically have a bunch of artifacts for doing things like caching base images and stuff? Thinking about like the idea of having sealed artifacts where it's like, hey, this is something that is um, uh, read only after it's actually created uh, for things. Like I could see like a whole bunch of like optimizing around artifacts and making sure that you're not downloading or up downloading stuff as much would, uh, would, be, would be good. So Bill, I did do the create secret similar to that. So we had that. Um, and Christy's saying, I don't think Conoco knows how to consume the secret unless you mount and point uh, the Conoco path with an environment variable. All right, so, so we're building it again. And we'll see what happens here. And then we're running out of time here. So we'll, if this doesn't work, then I'll just say, hey, you know, configuring secrets and connections and images. This is the type of stuff when everybody deals with this, they just bang their head against the wall. It's all fun and games until you have to sort of get all this configuration set up. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, you know, um, definitely, uh, um, you know, making that be as uh, uh, straightforward as possible. That's definitely going to be something that I think folks are going to struggle with. Um, and then being able to, did it work? Pushed blob, woohoo! All right, so now if we go through here and if I can find it wherever the heck this is in the like Google, none of these are any good by the way, just to be clear. Um, I think, uh, like finding stuff in any of these uh, consoles is really freaking hard. So compute, where's, can I do registry? GCR, container register, there we go. All right, so if things went as planned, Leroy Webb, look at that, it worked, we have an image. 6.6 .6 megabytes, we built it, we pushed it, awesome. All right, so that's super exciting. That's very, very cool. All right, so uh, sorry that that ended up being so hard because um, I feel like we haven't even gotten to pipelines yet, but I think understanding tasks, inputs, outputs, and like how you configure those, I think is super interesting. Um, we did the task run here. Okay, now a pipeline. A pipeline defines a list of tasks to execute in order while also indicating if any inputs and outputs should be used, blah, blah, blah. And the from field. So this is how you can sort of pipe things back and forth. This needs a visualization, obviously. Um, now I haven't looked at like, this starts to get very similar to things like Argo. And I would love to like compare and contrast, but I haven't looked at Argo in forever. So I'd love to see some of the decisions made with Tecton versus Argo and actually see what's happening here. Um, but, so what we have here is I just want to understand what's going on here. So this is a pipeline. So the first thing we're going to do is build, build and, and push the image. Okay, and then we have another thing which is deploy web to web, which essentially is you have, let's say, a deployment YAML and then, uh, and then essentially the, the thing that we want to modify and slam in there. So the parameter and the name of the image, oh, so this is a task. So we have to find this task. So this task actually takes deploy using cube control. We actually have a get source for the YAML. We have the name of the image. Uh, and we have the image that we're using, the, the 
So this isn't something that's interesting. So we have the image here. This is modeled as a resource, but also like is it, it's a read-only resource. It's essentially a string. So in some ways, this is a param also. So I think, you know, um, I think it's also interesting, like, like, like params versus resources, there's a subtlety there when they're small enough that they're essentially just strings. Um, and so that's something that's interesting. So, okay, so now we're actually going through, we have YQ, we're doing a little bit of like YAML mangling, and then we have run cube control that's actually gonna apply this stuff. And then obviously if you're using something like customize or cap or whatever, that's like a templating and apply thing, you could actually do it then also. Um, these things are actually reusing, let's see. So we have the YAML path to image, so the, the in, inputs params path, path is the path to the manifest to apply. This thing is essentially editing that thing in place. Uh, but I assume, and this is again, like there's an execution context for things in a task where they can actually share data between them. What that path, like there's a bunch of path names in here that feel very magic to me. Understanding the environment that's actually going in with this stuff would be super interesting to me. Um, and then, uh, and then we do the run and we're saying, okay, scaffold git. So we're reloading that git. So we end up, we don't have to resync. Since this is a persistent volume, we actually don't have to resync, I think, the, um, the, uh, the git repo. And then, uh, and then that's the, uh, the image, the path to the manifest to apply though. I would expect to see that in, to run the pipe, oh, with the pipeline run. Okay, and then we have deploy. Oh, workspace, source, examples, Microsoft. Yeah, so like where different things get mounted in is something that like, like where does workspace, source, examples, like what is workspace? And how does that relate to the Git repo, right? Because I think this is coming from the Git repo and what is the rewrite model for that stuff? Um, and what if I have multiple Git repos coming in, do they actually be source one and source two? Okay, so an input named foo gets mounted into foo. Okay, so this is source dash repo here. Okay, and then I see, so that's the resource. Oh, and then in the task, the input. So these are actually kind of volumes really. And then here, here we have an input. So the fact these are called inputs and not volumes, but they get mounted in a specific place, that's a little bit confusing. Okay, but this source matches up with this source. So if we had multiple Git, we could go ahead and do that. And then we have image here, which is a resource called web image. And that's from build scaffold web, which is this thing, which is the output of this built image, resource, web image. Okay, so this is a resource. I wonder what the from does here. Does the from, like why do I need the from? Because they're both referring to the same resource. Yeah, some resources don't make sense to be volume mounted, but then do they actually show up on disk, I think is the question. Okay, but I, th I understand sort of this gets, this gets mounted in and it's a resource. And then the resources that don't get volume mounted those things feel like they're kind of config parameters really. And so that's one of the things like there's a subtlety between artifact and, and config here. But now we're going through and we're actually doing a, uh, and we have Lockheed's Kubernetes cube control thing and we're actually doing an apply there. And then this is, assuming, this is assuming that you're just reusing your default service account. So there's a permission issue here that you're not addressing to be able to make this stuff work. Uh, I don't see any service account going on here. Okay, we're, we're, we're clear out of time, but I think I start seeing how pipelines can actually, because this is interesting because you're essentially, we have the, the build and push of the image is one thing. And then, and I actually think it's interesting that like this is because Conoco builds and pushes, but we could have Conoco produce a tar file and then we could have another thing that's like uses some of the OCI tools that takes that tar file and actually does the push. So the build and push could actually be separated out into multiple tasks. And so I think there is an open question around sort of like, how do you model tasks versus pipelines versus what have you? Um, 
So if you build an image, a task that gets the image from that image should be able to access the exact image that was built by Digest. Oh, I see. So one of the things that goes into the artifact is the actual Digest that got built so that you can actually make sure that you don't get any skew when you have a bunch of these things working uh, uh, in parallel, right? Because I could see like, hey, if you misconfigure multiple pipelines and they're all building the same image, and then you're referencing that image based on a label versus based on a digest, they could actually talk past each other and you could get non-hermetic results. Okay, so that makes sense. And then, okay, and then that from says, I'm actually like, I wanna make sure that I don't get version skew when I'm doing stuff like that. I mean, another way to look at this is that you could do some sort of resource lock, right? If a res, if, you know, hey, if I'm using a resource in a read-write mode, I can make sure that only one pipeline is using that at a time, but then you have to start thinking about critical sections through your pipeline around actually taking a lock on a particular resource across a set of steps. So that would be another way that I would actually be thinking about doing this. All right, pipeline run, boom, boom, boom. I don't think we're gonna be able to, to get through all this, but I think that gives us a good overrun of this. Very cool. And then there's so much more to explore because like we go here and we're like, I didn't get a plain chance to play with the, the command line. We didn't talk about the dashboard. Event triggering with these things ends up being really interesting because this is where this stuff starts actually overlapping with serverless stuff. When do you want to actually hook this stuff up to a, uh, to a trigger? Um, you know, can one of the things that I'd love to see is that like, do pipelines themselves actually have inputs and outputs. What is the scheme of a pipeline? Um, so can we actually create some sort of duct typing between pipelines and tasks where I can actually run a task run a pipeline, but they both have inputs and outputs. How do I actually specify that? Um, when I have a trigger, if I hook this up to an HTTP trigger or whatever, how do I pipeline, how do I actually do the, the, the inputs and outputs into the pipeline? So that's some of the stuff that's interesting. Uh, a standard catalog of tasks and pipelines so that it's easier to find these things. It looks like there's a lot here um, so that you're not actually going through and recreating this stuff from scratch. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of YAML wrangling and references and stuff like that. Can we actually create a sort of graphical tool for constructing these things such that we can guide people to the right problems? Because I think if I was writing that stuff by hand, it'd be super, super easy for me to fat finger one of these names and have things not line up. And then that becomes a total pain in the butt to debug. So, um, uh, yeah, so really cool stuff. Um, all right, so overarching thoughts is that I, I, I really like the project. I think there's a lot to like here. I would love to dig in and understand sort of compare and contrast with Argo. And I did definitely see in the, in the uh, um, let's see where we go in the, uh, there's the, the operator for installing and managing the thing. Um, but in the catalog, I definitely did see that there's like an Argo CD thing so like maybe you can do some stuff and actually have these things work with each other, which I think is really interesting. Um, having this line up with the eventing models that are being built up, whether it be cloud events or, or you know, the other stuff happening in, in Knative or other eventing models, I think is really, really interesting. Um, I'd love to see this stuff actually be more, less Google centric. Um, Cause like when I was looking at the, the setup here, um, you know, like I look at uh, um, in, the, in the install instructions, it's like you can either do PVs or GCS. Like, you know, what about S3? What about like Minio? Like, and I think, you know, looking at some of the stuff that we did with Valero in terms of actually making this work across a whole bunch of different storage cate categories is really interesting. Um, you know, uh, the concurrency model getting more more clear about sort of like how concurrency works when you actually have multiple things operating on the same uh, cluster is actually really interesting also. So very, very cool. Um, I think I'm totally running down the clock here. Thank you, everybody, for joining up. Thank you so much to the to the Tecton team for actually staying up late because I know a lot of y'all are on the East Coast or at least hopefully you got a beer in your hand. And... Um, and this is always fun. I always enjoy doing this. Um, things that I want to do in future episodes is I had a series where I was building a Minecraft controller um, operator. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I want to continue doing that. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if Duffy and others have ideas that they want to look at. 
Um, I'm definitely interested in looking at um, Q, which is a config language, similar in some ways to JSONit. A um, lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, if you got, uh, you know, Duffy's doing this series where he just digs deep into Kubernetes concepts and really explores them. Um, if you all have ideas on what you would like to see for episodes, reach out on Twitter, or you can go into the, the TGIK repo. It's heptio slash TGIK on GitHub. Um, we're going to be moving that over probably, I think we have to figure out when and how and the mechanics of it, but we're going to be moving that over to a Tanzu repo pretty soon. So a lot of fun stuff. There's a lot more to play with here. I feel like I only scratched the surface with Tecton, but thank you everybody for joining me. And I hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you all later.